Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. We are in the book of 1 Samuel. We're at chapter 15, and uh, we're continuing with King Saul and his legacy. Uh, we've talked at length at, by this point at how he was a fool. He was an intelligent fool. He did a lot of smart things. He actually was uh, later, uh, as he learned how to be a commander, a smart commander. He did good battle tactics. He uh, set up a sound administration for the country. But he missed the big things. He was not a man after God's own heart. He was not obedient to God. And we've seen that several times, and we've seen how that gets him into trouble. And chapter 15 is um, the final break. Uh, God casts him aside. So let's start with chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord set to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers, and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I will not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Ken Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Um, you know, Saul uh, has been given this task by God's prophet, Samuel, to go uh, exact revenge on the Amalekites. The Amalekites, when they uh, saw the Israelites um, escaping Egypt, uh, they basically set up a guerrilla uh, attack on Israel. And um, any stragglers out of the camp they would capture or kill. Uh, they would come in and steal uh, sheep and cattle and um, things. And they were a constant source of frustration. And uh, uh, as we've read, uh, Joshua commanded a force and defeated them in, in battle. Moses had to hold his hands up the whole day. And, you know, Joshua was successful, and Moses uh, had the Israelites swear that they would wipe the Amalekites out, and they have not yet. They have not grown in strength to, and now God is telling Saul to, to start that process um, and to go attack them, and he's being somewhat smart. He sets up an ambush. He tells their allies, the Kenites, who are also allies with Israel, to leave there, that he's going to destroy them, and he doesn't want to kill the Kenites in the process. And the Kenites were, of course, Moses' father-in-law's relatives. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so they are people, the Israelites, uh, view favorably. Um, they also worship Yahweh. And apparently after Moses had come back into the desert, um, they, at least for a period of time, obeyed the Mosaic law. Uh, they followed uh, Moses and what he told them to do. And um, they've been living among the Israelites, and they have apparently been more faithful to God than even the Israelites. And, um, but they're friendly with their other relatives, the Amalekites. Uh, and that's kind of the way Middle East politics goes. If you look at it, you know, uh, 
one of our allies has an enemy that's our ally and our ally has an enemy that's our ally. I mean, uh, you know, and that's just the way that goes. And you can't draw a neat, here's two sides and everybody over here we fight and everybody over here we're allies with. It's it's messy and a constantly shifting alliance and who's in the fight constantly shifts and who's allied with who and um, in the middle of the fight two old enemies that find themselves on the same side suddenly start fighting each other in the middle of the fight. I mean, you get that. Um, it's been that way for millennia. And this is a case of that. But Saul is sending his allies, the Kenites, away, saying, I don't want to attack you. I don't want to destroy your stuff. I don't want to... And we're after the Amalekites. Um, and, you know, y'all move away. And they did. Um... Verse 7, then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. The Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. They got greedy. And they killed the weak flocks, the weak sheep, the weak cattle, uh, those that were diseased. and But those that were the best ones, the, the healthiest, that were the nicest, they kept them. They were going to improve their stocks by acquiring Amalekite stocks, the good stuff. It's not what God told them to do. And they were supposed to kill Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Now, if Saul had taken him back to put him on trial and execute him, that would have been one thing, I suppose. But that's not what God said to do. Um... Saul's probably trying to get him as a bargaining chip so that um, he can make some sort of treaty and the rest of the Amalekites will leave the Israelites alone in exchange for Agag or some such. I mean, we don't really know what was going on in Saul's mind, but he spared him. He wasn't supposed to. Um, and they weren't supposed to spare the best cattle, the best sheep. They were supposed to kill it all, kill them all. And um, the Amalekites were shepherds. They were Bedouins. Um, they actually didn't live in cities very often. Um, the one city they have uh, is apparently their main city. Uh, archaeology says it was a little more than a village. Um, so with this large number of troops, he should have been able to, you know, wipe it out. Chasing the Bedouins through the desert was probably harder, um, particularly foot soldiers, because the Amalekites were famous for being cattle, uh, camel riders. And um, foot soldier... Uh, chasing camels through the desert is almost um, a recipe for disaster. Um, but God was with the Israelites and they were doing a good job destroying the Amalekites. So why did they quit obeying God? They got greedy. They saw the best and they kept the best. Um, 
verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. So the Lord reveals to Samuel that Saul is disobedient and Samuel is grieved and he spends the night pleading with God, crying. Uh, crying with God's own heart. Uh, God was crying because Saul was disobedient. And um, Saul uh, is grieving both God and Samuel, and Samuel is expressing it. And um, the people around Samuel knows that Samuel is distraught. And, um, you know, Samuel records it later. Uh, verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul's gone to Calamity. There he set up a monument in his own honor, has turned and gone down to Gilgal. So, he's crossing across the southern parts of Israel, and he set up a monument to himself. He's like all conquering kings. He likes to memorize how good a job he does. Um, well, he hasn't really done that good a job. He just thinks he's done a great job. Um, and then he goes to the other, another important location, Gilgal. And um, Samuel keeps chasing him down. Verse 13. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. Saul brags that he's done the job when he hasn't done the job. Verse 14, But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from, brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. What wishy-washy politi <laughs> politician-like talk is that? Oh, we did the job, and Samuel points out, but I hear sheep and cattle. You didn't leave as an army with sheep and cattle. Where did you get them? You know, um, you're not supposed to have sheep and cattle. And Saul then makes his half-hearted excuse. Oh, it's the soldier's fault. He's blaming somebody else. And they spared the best to sacrifice. Um, that's not what God told them to do. God told them to kill them all. That they were to effectively sacrifice the entire people and all the goods. Since they were shepherds, that's their animals. Um, and um, then he says, but we destroyed the rest. Um, no, you didn't destroy it all. That's why there's some left. If you destroyed it all, there wouldn't be any left. Um, you know, um, you're, you're just flat lying and lying about what happened, trying to explain why you didn't do what you were told to do. Um, you know, he's, he's stuck there. He's caught, caught breaking what God told him to do. Um, he's trying to say, I did it while he didn't. And um, he's getting caught with goods. And he's trying to blame other people that helped him do it. Yeah, no, no, this doesn't fly. I mean, if somebody had snuck a sheep back to their tent, and that's what Samuel was talking about, Samuel could, Saul could go, I thought we did. Let's bring out the guilty guy and the sheep and, you know, deal with it. And 
you know, execute one sheep and one guilty guy, and we'd be done, uh, like uh, Moses did to uh, Hathan when he took the robe and the silver and the gold. No, uh, this is the whole army that's guilty because they obeyed Saul's orders. And Saul basically told him to spare the best stuff. And after the fact, Saul is saying, oh, we're going to sacrifice him to God. That's not what you that's not what you're doing. And even if you were, that's not what God told you to do. God didn't ask for a bunch of sacrifice. God said, just totally destroy it. Verse 16. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? So Samuel's being a prophet, calling him out. And saying, you disobeyed. Verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to the Lord, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Samuel is in full prophet mode. He's probably figured out by this point in time why God has him still in ministry and why he hadn't uh, finished his ministry. Sure, he's quit being a judge. Uh, that that function has been passed over to Saul and his administration. And apparently it's being handled reasonably well because uh, no mention is made of it, which means there was no problems worth noting. And um, now Samuel is having to be a prophet and tell the king face to face, you have sinned, and here's how you've done it, and here's the consequences. And Samuel flat tells him he's no longer going to be king. And it's because it's a rebellion to God and that he is, that God didn't want sacrifice. Um, God doesn't need charred meat. He doesn't need smoke. He doesn't need, you know, we do that to show we are dedicated to God. Um, you know, if we understand that, it's, it's, God doesn't need our money in one sense. He wants us to do the work of the kingdom and that, and here on the earth that takes, um, Financing, you got to pay the missionaries, you got to pay those who support them, you, uh, that do the logistics and stuff. Um, and you got to, you know, if you say you're going to hire a plane to fly somebody somewhere, you got to pay the bills to fly the plane, whether it's buying a ticket on a commercial airline or hiring a, com a pilot with their own plane uh, to do a single person or what. You know, um, you got to put people on boats or trains or cars or taxis or, you know, whatever. Um, logistics has to happen. And um, that means either you got to own the planes, the boats, the trains, or you got to pay for their services. And um, 
it's a, it's a great deal of uh, wise financial stewardship of what's the appropriate thing. And there's places in the world where mission sending organizations own their own uh, transportation companies and um, you know transport their own people around and sometimes other uh, mission organization people around sometimes even hire out uh, to people they trust to not abuse the privilege and um, you know sometimes it's better to hire uh, already uh, established and um, you know what's the best use of resources well that depends upon the situation where you are and where you're going and um, yeah we got to support missionaries in that area. we got to support them financially uh, but more importantly we got to pray for them uh, you got to make sure the spiritual is right pray that the uh, field is uh, ready for planting the seeds and uh, ready for harvest and that um, the people will listen and uh, people come to know the Lord and in turn be discipled and join and do the task of ministry and uh, that you know but you do have to make sure that they're sent and paid and you can't just expect somebody to volunteer and throw them out there and say mm, you're on your own that doesn't work uh even dedicated people go mm, if i'm on my own i can't do this and they quit very few have a constitution that some of the early missionaries had they knew they were making a one-way trip and they would never be back and they went for the gospel and they weren't sure what kind of results they would get and they kept going anyway and some of them took decades to win the first convert because they didn't know what they were doing and they were learning as they went and um, we honored them for their dedication and we learned from their experiences good and bad and the people that followed them and their experiences good and bad and yeah we're more effective today uh, we typically send teams in and everybody has a position, a strategy and what they're going to do for the team and um, part of that team is the part that stays behind the United States and makes sure that everybody's paid and that you know, fares, travel fares are paid and that housing at the other end is acquired whether it's rental or buying or what and they then have the ability to focus on it and we've learned what strategies work and what strategies don't and uh, we've learned how to pray over a community and figure out where we need to go uh, Sometimes we fail to do it right. Sometimes we fail. It's just a hard field and it doesn't work the way we expect and we want. But we've, we've learned tactics. And God is blessing that. And part of that tactics is we as the people left behind here in the United States and the other parts of, this, of the world that have Christianity are to pray for our missionaries and pray for them daily, pray for them routinely. Um, that we will do the spiritual work and implore the Father to send the Holy Spirit and proceed them and to empower them and to protect them and provide for them. And that takes obedience. And that's what Saul did not have. He he had the form of religion without the heart for it. He'd been told to kill everything, every animal, and he didn't. He spared what he considered the best. And God therefore knew his heart and was grieved over it. Samuel was grieved over it. 
and Samuel had the um, uh, unappealing uh, task of then telling Saul, God has rejected you and rejected this king. And um, that, that had to be a very, very uh, tense moment. The prophet face to face with the king, telling him that he's been rejected. Samuel, I mean, Saul still lying and saying, Oh, we did what God told us to do. No, you didn't. Yeah, Samuel's been sitting here and telling you what you did. He still lies and says, um, and you know, Samuel says that that kind of rebellion is like the sin of divination, and that kind of arrogance like the sin of idolatry. Uh, you can look around the world um, at politicians that are like that, and lying like that and still getting caught and it's both parties both major parties are doing it i mean i can, I can name names but i'm just gonna leave it without names because you know uh, you know uh, and they're caught and the press makes a big deal out of it and they apparently get away with it time and time and time again And um, that kind of arrogance is like idolatry. It will cause God to put us under condemnation. Let enemies invade us. Send drought. Send uh, flood. Send dev weather devastation. Send earthquakes. Send pestilence and disease. All the things that God said he would send on his people. Does that sound like I'm quoting the news? <laughs> and yeah, in one sense I am. I mean, God is trying to wake us up as a people. He sent everything that he says he's going to send against rebellious and disobedient people. And we still haven't paid attention. If we don't pay attention soon, God will wipe us out. Just like he wiped Saul out, eventually. We have to be humble before God. Saul was not. Verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. This sounds like he's repentant. But he's still blaming the people. He's not really taking credit. He's saying, yeah, I've sinned. Okay, you caught me. But it's their fault. It's the same thing that we've said since Adam and Eve. You know, God called Adam down. You ate of the fruit. Oh, but it was the woman you gave me. And Eve says, "It, but it was the serpent. Yeah, you caught us, but... No, no, no. That's... Uh, that's... That's not repentance. That's not. And he's asking for the public blessing of being seen as favorable to God while still being under condemnation from God. That's not how that works. God's not going to honor you for sinning. Particularly when the prophet has just told you God's going to wipe you out. God's going to reject you. 
that's not how that works. So he's trying to bargain with God. Oh, I'll make a public contrition and blame somebody else, and then you'll be okay with me? No, that doesn't work with people. It definitely doesn't work with God. Verse 26, But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul grabbed a hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not man that he would change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him confidently, thinking, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, although Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Samuel's grieving, the Lord's grieving. Now, the Lord knew that Saul was this way, but he needed somebody to prepare the people. The first king was going to have a hard time. There's going to be a lots of mistakes made. And he needed somebody as a placeholder. And he needed somebody to start making some headway against the enemies outside. And do things like kill the Amalekites. Um, Samuel does complete the job that Saul uh, was sent to do. He kills Agag, the last of the Amalekites. Um, Notice Agag thought he came in confident. He thought, it's over. I'm 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 gonna get my pardon and I'm gonna be able to start over again. He's uh, not very good either. That's why God has him want to wipe out. And Samuel kills him. Samuel understood. And Yeah, they offer sacrifices and kill the rest of the sheep there. That wasn't what they were supposed to be doing. Um, but uh, that task got completed. But it got completed by rebellion. And Saul does uh, wheedle Samuel into going back with him and going to the sacrifice. And that's why Samuel manages to get to where he can kill Agag. Um, so God had Samuel achieve uh, one of the goals. But it was not a good time. A quote, Saul worshipped God. In other words, he ate the sacrificial meat. From the animals he wasn't supposed to spare. He went to the feast. You gotta understand that worship, they sacrificed the animal, they cooked it, and they ate. Yeah, some of it got burned, but most of it got eaten. Samuel was trying to tell him, no, 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 you don't worship with the goods God told you not to, to kill and wipe out and not to bring back. That's not what God wanted. And Saul does it anyway. Saul gets his way on the short term at the destruction of his kingdom. And Samuel never goes in to see Saul again. And he's grieved that Saul is king. God is grieved that Saul is king. And they both 
weeping for Saul. They understand. Um, Samuel probably doesn't understand his eternal fate the way God does. But Samuel and God uh, both know this is a bad state. And it's not going to end well. And they're grieving for Saul and his family. And they're grieving for the kingdom. Because it was, it was a bad situation. And Samuel never, ever again sees Saul. Uh, he's produced, uh, pronounced this uh, uh, condemnation on Saul. He still has to be a prophet, and he's going to go do some other things. And, uh, uh, you know, we're going to see. Um, in chapter 16, some of the good that's fixed to come out of things. Uh, God's still working. But uh, they're both uh, heartbroken that uh, Saul is so disobedient. Holy Father, make us be humble. Uh, make us be people who are obedient to you. That we don't twist your word, we don't change it, we don't say, oh, I did it when we half do it. That you don't want uh, halfway jobs, you don't want partial obedience, you want total commitment. For you are king of the earth and everyone will bow and worship you. But those who do that now and obey you now are going to be the ones that are rewarded. Those who are forced to labor are going to be the ones destroyed or killed. Uh, halfway obedience today, lukewarm, wishy-washy obedience is what you dislike. Uh, as you said, you would spit the lukewarm out of your mouth. Um, Lord, have our hearts tender. Have us be humble. Have us to dwell in your presence, to pray, to study your word, to seek your face, to understand you so that we can obey you better. And then turn in repentance as we understand better and live closer and closer lives to you, more and more obedient. Uh, have us to be repentant that we will turn from our wicked way and follow your righteous way. And that as we do so, uh, you will bless our lives. Uh, Lord, it does come at cost. We must give up ourselves and our own wants and our own desires and our own things and our own forms of doing things and do them your way. Have us to understand you correctly and not twist it, not change it to what we want. That we won't cherry pick for what we desire. But we'll understand what you want us to do. And no matter how hard it is for us, we will be obedient to it. Lord, I ask that you would uh, bless our church. Have us to be humble before you. Have us to be obedient to you. Have us to turn from our wicked way to your way. That we quit um, compromising with the world around us. We quit being uh, uh, living with uh, some of the desires of the world, some of the reactions of the world, and some of the ways of the world. Instead, we live wholly for you. Lord, uh, have that revival start in us. Grow us individually, spiritually. Grow us uh, in you. Grow us in knowledge and in strength and obedience. That you can grow your kingdom in this spot. In your holy name. Amen. And I am your host, uh, Frank Reich. And this has been the Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, uh, October 5th, uh, 2022. This is being recorded Saturday, uh, October 1st, 2022.
and will be available online tonight. Um, I hope to see you tomorrow at church, and uh, if you're not there, uh, I hope to see you Wednesday evening uh, at the Bible study, and if you're not able to make that either, uh, we'll see you next week here on YouTube. Have a blessed week.